You have me confused, O'Bannon. But don't bother to explain now. Ride out of here before that mob decides to hang you. Have gun. Will travel. Starring Mr. John Daner as Paladin. San Francisco, 1875. The Carlton Hotel. Headquarters of a man called Paladin. Come in. Oh, good morning, Mr. Paladin. Good morning, Miss Wong. You want me see Wong help you pack? Oh, thanks. I don't think so. I'm traveling light this trip. I'll be riding through some pretty rough country. Oh, where you go? I'm doing a job for an insurance company, Miss Wong. They're concerned about their losses. Want me to survey the freight routes up through the north and check with the express offices along the way. Yeah, that does it. Hey, hey, boy, told me that you and he were going out in the town last night. Oh, yes, I... Hey, boy, take Missy Wong to see very fine stage play. What did you see? Oh, my. There was a little girl named Topsy. Oh, Topsy, Topsy yes. Topsy, yes. Mm-hmm. And a little girl named Eva. Yes. And nice old man named Mr. Uncle Tom. Mr. Uncle Tom. Mr. Uncle Tom, Mr. You know what, Mr. Polydon? Poor Mr. Uncle Tom, he... Well, he... I understand, Miss Wong. A little girl named Eva, she... Oh, Mr. Polydon, we have such a good time. On the road between the town of Lexington, Massachusetts, and the Concord River Bridge are a number of stones and monuments that are a part of our American heritage. In the spring of 1775, the Minutemen of New England brought together a supply of stores and munitions in the small village of Concord. The Provincial Congress had voted for the stockpile for defense only, but British General Gage regarded the collected munitions and stores as potentially dangerous to King George's troops. On April 19, 1775, Gage dispatched a force under Major Pitcairn to capture the stockpile. The route of the British troops took them through the town of Lexington, which had been alerted by Paul Revere and others. At Lexington, the British were met by a small American force and a skirmish ensued on Village Green. The American Revolution had begun. Their superior numbers allowed the British to continue their advance toward Concord. But William Prescott, who had ridden with Paul Revere, carried a warning of their approach. Pitcairn's British regulars moved into Concord and occupied north and south bridges, while a small group of Minutemen waited across the river for reinforcements. When help for the Colonials arrived from nearby towns, the British were forced to withdraw across North Bridge. Here shots were exchanged, and the British were forced into a retreat. The retreat soon became a disorderly rout as Minutemen fired on Pitcairn's men from behind walls, houses, and barns. The Colonials had won the day. Today, the brave actions of the American fighting men at Lexington and Concord are marked by many monuments, including the famous statue of the Minuteman. Some of the original landmarks are still preserved. The monuments at Lexington and Concord remind us of the rich heritage that as Americans we share and stand ready to defend. The towns along my route were scattered and the distances were great. I had reached northern Nevada and I was following a trail that wound its way over a rugged mountain pass. The trail had been chipped from a rocky cliff which rose straight up on one side and then took a sheer drop of several hundred feet on the other. When I reached the top and started down toward the Humboldt River Valley, I saw a man ahead of me. He was riding lazy, guiding his horse carefully, when suddenly, on a sharp turn, the animal seemed to spook fold up, and in the next instant was jogging down the path with an empty saddle. Well, I couldn't travel any faster. I could only hope that when I reached the spot where the man had gone over the edge, I'd find him alive. Ooh, ooh. Yeah. 
Hey, down there. Can you hear me? Yes, man, and it's a fine sound to be sure. Are you all right? Oh, I'm fine. Until this bit of a tree stump I'm hanging to gives way. You got any kind of foothold down there? Some. I've got a rope up here. Hold on, I'll get it to you. Oh, that's fine, sir. Oh, you know. Easy, boy. Now stand. All right. Here she goes. You got it? I got it. I tied around your waist. Yes, sir. Let me know when you're ready. I'll start hauling. Yes, I'm trying. Good. Ah, there. Huh. Ready now. All right. Here we go. You hold it, man. What? What's the trouble? Why, well, would you give us a bit of slack on that rope, will you now? Uh, it's the present for Katie. What's that? Katie's present it fell out in my pocket. I can reach it if you give me a bit of slack. How's that? Oh, that's fine, sir. All right, haul away, my hearty. Oh, ah, it's grateful. Uh, hey. Grateful I am to you, sir. Oh, Bannon's me name, sir. Red, they call me, and I needn't be telling you why. And, uh, eh... Hey, when I catch me breath, I have a few words to say about that no good, cussed, not headed horse that twice in a month has set me down without even so much as a by your leave. Well, never mind the horse. We better check you for broken bones. Oh, no, sir, no, no. Bannon's a tough one, though I am. Uh, hurting a bit in a few places, but uh, praise be, Katie's present is safe. Katie's present? Ah, uh, would you be after knowing what day this is, sir? Well, yes, it's Thursday. That's right, in March the 17th, and that, of course, is St. Patrick's Day, but... More than that, it's the birthday of me darling, Katie. Your wife? Yes, yeah, sir. Like a man, I'm afraid I was after forgetting the occasion. Until Katie, like a woman, dropped a hint here and there. So I had to saddle up and ride into town to buy the gigaw. Well, we better get started down the trail. You go ride my horse and I'll walk. Oh, now, a fine thing that'd be. To thank a man for saving me life by taking the horse out from under him. No, sir, O'Bannon will walk. A good walk will take... Uh, <coughs> Kinks out of me. It was almost sundown before we reached the O'Bannon farmhouse. Katie was waiting at the gate. She was tiny and gay and very pretty. And she insisted that I stay to share the birthday celebration. Then it got so late, they both insisted that I stay the night. They were warm, friendly people. And when I left the next morning, it was with the promise to see them on my way back. My business took me on into Idaho, and it was nearly two months before I passed through Nevada again. The last stop on my route was the town of Tawana, only 20 miles from the O'Bannon place. I checked into a hotel, and then started for the Horseshoe Saloon. You ain't gonna get a drink in there, mister. Oh, why not? We're holding a trial in there today. Trial? It's gonna start as soon as the judge gets here. Once it starts, it won't last long. Open and shut case. Yeah, I just kept watching. I knew I'd see the feller again someday. Well, who's that? Fellow on trial. Robbed my stage, killed my shotgun rider. I got a good look at him. I knew I'd spot him again, and I did. Over in Lander County. Sheriff brought him in. You gonna visit the trial? No. No, I have business at the freight office. Just thought I'd have a drink first. We'll fix him. Dirty killer. Fellow name of O'Bannon. O'Bannon? Know him? Well, I'm acquainted with an O'Bannon up this way, but... Uh, I'm sure it isn't the same one. Well, we're going to fix him. Quick and good. About ten miles north of Springfield, Massachusetts, and five miles northeast of Chicopee, is Westover Air Force Base, headquarters for the 8th Air Force. The field was named after Oscar Westover, who was chief of the Air Corps from 1935 until his death in 1938. Westover was born in Bay City, Michigan, July 1883. He entered the Army as a private in 1901 and graduated from West Point in 1906. During the infancy of flight, Westover became interested in the air service and worked in the office of director of air service in 1918. 
1922, he became the director of aircraft production for the Army. Then in 1928, Westover was offered a post as assistant to the Chief of the Air Corps. He held this assignment until 1935, when he was commissioned a Major General and moved up the ladder to Air Corps Chief. About this time, there was much discussion concerning the value of air power. Like other top Air Corps officers, General Westover pointed out the need for a stronger Air Force. Together with General Andrews, he advocated a policy whereby the Air Corps could have more fighting power and become a more independent unit. Unfortunately, in 1938, Westover was killed in a plane crash before his recommendations were placed in effect. Despite his untimely death, Westover holds an important place in the growth of American air power. Men like General Westover serve as a reminder that those who today wear the Air Force uniform also play a most important part in the progress of air power the instrument which is so vital for the preservation of our American way of life. I had started down the street to the Tawana freight office when I saw the sheriff bringing the prisoner from the jail. It was hard to believe. But the O'Bannon on trial was my red-haired friend of the mountain trail. He didn't glance in my direction but I decided to postpone my business and visit the trial after all. What the court convened in the Horseshoe Saloon lacked in formality, it made up for in its obvious zeal to fix him quick and good. Circuit Judge Charlie Cagle called the court to order, and Wes Barker took the stand. Uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth shall be God? I do. Sit down. Well, there he sits, Judge. Right there, the... Now, please, Mr. Barker, not so fast. I want you to tell us just what happened. Well, the coach wasn't running just on schedule that day. We didn't have no passengers. But we had some important freight to carry. Valuable freight? Gold. The shipment wasn't ready on our regular time to leave, so we waited for it. And when was this? Oh, two months ago. You remember what day, exactly? Sure. It was March 17th. We just got a ways out of town, about sundown it was. When this man, and this man right here, he busts out in the road and flags us down and yells, this is a holdup. He got a gun right in my face. Now, Joe Pinelli rode shotgun with me for six years. He knew when to throw down on a holdup man, when not to. Joe didn't throw down on this fella, but he plugged him anyway. Got a shot off at me, too, but he just nicked me. He took the gold? What he could carry. And I got a good look at him. And last month, when I seen him over in Lander County, I recognized him and told the sheriff. That's him sitting right there. Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess that'll be all, Mr. Parker. Oh, say, Judge Cagle, <laughs> your honor. Yes. Say, don't I know you? I think so. My name is Paladin. Sure. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Paladin? Well, I'd like to be sworn in, your honor. A man's life is at stake here, and I, I just don't understand it. There's something terribly wrong. Yeah. Come on up here. Thank you. All right, let's, let's keep it quiet now. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, help you, God? I do. Sit down. <laughs> Judge, if this murder and holdup occurred on March 17th, about sundown, the man sitting here, O'Bannon, can't be guilty. Uh, quiet down. Let's keep order. Why do you say that? Because I was with O'Bannon on March 17th, at that time. And he was over 40 miles from here. That's all. Uh, let's have order, please. Well, now, you better tell us the whole story. Start from the beginning, Mr. Paladin. All right, case dismissed. That's all for today. Mister? Yeah. I can't figure what your game is, but you sure didn't make yourself any friends here. Look, I'm sorry, Barker. I told the truth. Yeah. You might have put a reasonable doubt in the judge's mind, but I know better. You said yourself it was almost sundown when the holdup occurred, and it must have all happened pretty fast. You could be mistaken, you know. No. No mistake. I saw O'Bannon kill my shotgun rider. Joe had a lot of friends. 
If the law ain't gonna take care of the man that murdered him, maybe his friends will have to. Uh, that's mighty careless talk, Barker. Look at that. Sheriff's turning him loose. That dirty killer walking out of town a free man when he ought to be hanging on the end of a rope right now. And we can thank you for butting in with your big lying mouth. I didn't lie. I know better. Now, like I say, I don't know what your game is, but it ain't over yet. Here comes your friend. He ain't seen the last of this. You can tell him. Hey, O'Bannon. Oh, hello, friend. O'Bannon, you better get out of here. Well, thanks, and uh, what do I owe you? What do you mean? Well, one good turn deserves another. What What can I do for you? What, what, what do you want? Well, I don't want anything. I had to tell the truth. Truth? Uh, mister, you never saw me before in your life, and you know it. Listen, if it's some sort of a joke, I don't appreciate it. And I'm afraid this is no time for questions and answers. These people watching us, they're in an ugly mood. Ah, they, they, they don't waste any love on me, do they? They're dangerous. I've seen it happen too many times. You better get out of town as fast as you can. Oh, but I intend to. I have my plans all made. And uh, thanks again, friend, for your, for your pretty lies. You have me real confused, O'Bannon. But I'll expect some answers for this, and they better be good. I'll ride out to your place tomorrow. My place? All right, just get going, O'Bannon. Oh, sure. There he goes, there he goes. Oh, Paladin. What? You'll find me at North Fork. I watched O'Bannon walk away, trying in my mind to make some kind of sense out of the whole thing. His last remark was easily heard by the people left in the courtroom, and with the mood that crowd was in, he might just as well have been sending out invitations to his own lynching. There was no question about it. If he really intended to show up in North Fork, he'd have a lot of angry men waiting for him. As soon as I had finished my business the next day, I headed out of town in the direction of the O'Bannon farmhouse. I wanted to see Katie. As I rode up to the house, I noticed a winded, lathered horse, ground tied in the front yard. Ooh. Go, oh, Katie. You black hearted. Hey. Stand back. Go on. Stand by. Stand back. Hey, Katie. 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 Paladin. What have you done? O'Bannon. O'Bannon. He's dead. God have mercy on me. Give me the gun. Oh, it had to be done. I don't understand this, Katie. Your own husband... No, 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 not my husband, not Ray. It, it is Liam O'Bannon lies there. Liam? Born of the same mother within the same hour. And on the outside, as alike as two peas in a pod, my man and Liam. But inside... One is black and one is white. Now, wait a minute, Kitty. You mean this man is your husband's twin brother? Yes. But my O'Bannon is the daylight. And this one, the dark, possessed of the evil ones he was. I knew it then, when they, the two came courting and it was Red I chose to marry. What was Liam doing here? It was after forcing me to leave this place with him with wicked words of how he'd sent my O'Bannon riding off to his death. Off to it? Katie, where's Red? Gone to answer the call of Liam, as he always has, should Liam so much as crook his little finger. One of Liam's rogues that traveled with him came early this morning with a message. What was the message? That Red should ride to North Fork. North Fork? And wait until Liam should meet him there. But Liam came here instead to take me off with him. Katie, it just might be that Red is riding to his death. Oh. How long ago did he start? Oh, oh some time now. I'll have to go after him. Katie, will you get me a blanket? Oh, yes. I'm afraid Liam must ride with me. As the crow flies, North Fork wasn't far. But the trail over the mountain was narrow and winding and travel was slow. With the head start Red had, it was a chancy thing whether I could reach there in time to save him from the trap he was riding into. It was late in the day when I saw the little town just ahead. All right, mister, that's far enough. Parker, drop your gun. 
I've got something to tell you. We had to listen to you once before. We're done listening now. Drop the gun. Mister, we ain't gonna take any interference this time. I told you it's up to us now to take care of the man who killed our friend Joe Pinelli. We're waiting for him. You mean he hasn't shown up yet? No, but we'll get him. Well, you won't have to wait any longer. The man you want is riding my second horse, wrapped in that blanket. What are you talking about? See for yourself. Jim, all right. What happened? Doesn't matter. The death of your friend Joe Pinelli has been avenged, Barker. An eye for an eye. That's what you wanted, isn't it? So now I trust you'll give Liam O'Bannon a suitable burial. Then I started back down the mountain trail. Whatever had delayed Red O'Bannon's trip to North Fork had saved his life. But I became more and more concerned as to what had happened to him. I reached the end of the rocky ledge, and there, off to the right, in a grassy meadow, was a horse that looked somehow familiar. He was nibbling grass and wearing an empty saddle. I turned around and went back up the trail. Hey, Red! Red, O'Bannon! Hey! Hey, Red! Like the voice of an angel! Ooh. Red? Yes! Red, you all right? For the time being. Yeah, Paladin. Yeah. That no good cussed, not headed horse. He did it again. Yeah, well, you can be mighty grateful to that no good cussed, not headed horse. What's that? Never mind. I'll get the rope. <laughs> Gun will travel. Created by Herb Meadow and Sam Rolfe, is produced and directed in Hollywood by Frank Paris and stars John Daner as Paladin with Virginia Gregg as Miss Wong. Tonight's story was specially written for Have Gun Will Travel by Ann Dowd. Specially featured in the cast was Ben Wright with Harry Bartell, Jack Moyles, and Gene Bates. This is Hugh Douglas inviting you to join us again next week when CBS Radio presents Have Gun, Will Travel. Have Gun, Will Travel is brought to you through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.